Let us prepare our hearts with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Draw near to us once more as we begin a season of waiting, Lord, accompany us on the journey. As we listen for your voice, speak to us through your scriptures. In the quiet of this time and in the days ahead, remind us that we are yours and you are with us always, even to the end of the age. So bless now the reading and the hearing and the sharing of your word. For you are forever our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So added to the prophet Isaiah and his words about waiting, we have another scripture that comes from the Hebrew scripture from the Psalms. This is Psalm 130. Martin Luther particularly liked this psalm. He called it the doctor of all orthodoxy, capturing in its few verses the core teachings and values of our faith. So listen carefully to this psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let my ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquity, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in God's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with God is great power to redeem. For it is God who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to start with a short pop quiz. And you're allowed to confer with your pew mates or whoever is near you at home as you're watching today for these three questions. Question number one, true or false? You increase your chances of winning the lottery by playing the same numbers every time. True or false? Now, keep it yourself. We're going to have to see how this works here. But you can still share with your neighbors. All right, question number two. If six babies were born last night at McGee Hospital, what is the most likely order of birth of the babies? Boy, 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 girl, 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 or boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy. (laughs) And question number three, how big of a group of people do you need to gather together so that there's a 50% chance that two of them will share the same birthday? Now we're going to go back to the questions. Question number one. We often hear stories of someone who played the exact same numbers over and over again, and then one day they finally won the big jackpot of a lottery. And so we assume there is some correlation between that behavior and winning the lottery. But in effect, there actually is no correlation. Lotteries are by definition random. And so whether you play the same number over and over again, or whether you let the little machine pick out for you six numbers to play, you have the exact same chance, very, very small chance, of winning the lottery. So the answer is false. Question number two. It may be odd to imagine that on a given night in the hospital, In the maternity ward, the nurses would announce that they suddenly had three boys and then three girls born. Or to say we had a total of six girls born in rapid succession. We as a species are pattern seekers. And so we think that births in a hospital should follow a pattern similar to the alternations of you flipping a coin looking for head or for tails. And so we assume 
Well, then the most likely pattern of births in a hospital should be boy, girl, boy, girl, or maybe boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy. But in truth, the births are totally random. And any likely sequence of boy and girl, including a sequence that's all boys or all girls, are just as likely as the other options. And then question number three, this is where you needed some math. If there are 365 days in the year, then the simple thought is that, well, I need a group of about 365 people to make sure that at least two of them have the same birthday. And if I only wanted a 50% chance, well, then I need a group that's about half that size, maybe 183 people. But the reality is each person is being compared with every other person in the group. And so you don't need as many people as you would expect. In truth, if you wanted a 99% chance that two people in a room had the same birthday, you would only need 57 people. And if you wanted a 50% chance that two of them shared the same date, you only need 23. Now what does any of this have to do with God or the Bible or Psalm 130? As I mentioned, human beings are pattern-seeking species. We are biologically programmed to look for patterns and then to adjust our behavior accordingly. A Neanderthal walking across the Serengeti Plain might see one lion per day on the horizon. But on a particular afternoon, he or she saw two lions. Now, the number of lions on that plain is totally random, but if there are more predators in the area, then to the Neanderthal's benefit, it makes sense to take cover. Our lives every day are filled with random events. And it's fine for us to react to what we see, to make changes in our behavior, like hiding from lions, or maybe carrying an umbrella if dark clouds are in the Pittsburgh sky. But it's a different thing altogether to believe that there's a correlation here, that there's a pattern at work. Some nights, six baby girls are born in a hospital ward. Sometimes what looks like a pattern is really just the randomness of life. Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker was interviewed one time and he asked, is there a pattern in what looks to be a convergence of significant negative events in the world right now? This rise of global authoritarianism throughout the countries, this COVID pandemic and the climate crisis that all the nations are facing. Does it mean by this convergence that the world is, quote, going to hell in a handbasket. And Pinker said, well, it is important to react to events that are around us, to do things to mitigate the bad events, and to take steps to make things better. But the fact that they're clustering together does not necessarily mean there's any sort of pattern. Whenever events are scattered throughout time, they will cluster together instead of being evenly spaced out. Now that sounds paradoxical, but it's true. You would need something else, something non-random, to carefully space out events, good or bad, to have them appear in a regular fashion in time. Because the reality is, random events, by being random, are not going to be evenly spaced out. They will come in clusters. Now, life is full of random events. In reacting to these random events, we then look for a pattern. We superimpose an order on them to try and make sense of the world around us. And as people of faith, we are quite, quite prone to naming God as the one who is creating these patterns, who happens to be blessing us when several good things happen in a row, or perhaps who is angry with us, cursing us 
when bad things seem to happen in clusters. But that's not the way of faith, according to Psalm 130. Now remember how the psalm began. The opening words said, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. The image here is as as if we are sinking below the waves of a stormy sea. In these moments, we feel swamped, overwhelmed, literally going down for the third time. When bad things happen then, we regularly use the language of being swamped, caught in the depths of bad tidings. We speak about a recession that is deepening or of a crisis that is getting deeper. We talk about being deeply depressed, about coming down with a cold or a flu. But the psalmist never says what caused these depths, these troubles. Instead, what the psalm does is name that sometimes we find ourselves there and we struggle to stay afloat. So think for a moment about a time in your life when you cried out to God from the depths. Now being rational creatures, in that moment, we then look for a way out. We would look for a way out of the depths. And we look for a pattern, maybe a way to make sense of a wave of bad luck. And in looking for that pattern, voices may whisper to us, well, maybe these bad things are happening because you're being punished, because your sins have caught up with you. And if you just try better, if you just work harder, you will find solid footing and all will be well. But that's wrong. And the psalmist knew we would think that way. And so the very next verse bluntly challenges this idea that we can save ourselves simply by figuring out the pattern of bad tidings. The psalmist says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, then who could stand? If the report card of our lives truly is based on this reckoning of good deeds accumulated and bad deeds that are demerits and sins and failings, then Who would stand? Who could get a passing grade? Who could claim self-righteousness before the eyes of a perfect God? Good Protestant theology reminds us we are not saved by works. We're saved by grace. And that's the core truth in where the psalm leads us. Because after it names who could stand if God marked our iniquities, it says, but there is forgiveness with you that you, the Lord, may be revered. We cannot get out of the depths on our own. And we certainly can't earn our way or figure out a shortcut to make things better. Because salvation is not transactional. It is foundational. God forgives us. God hears when we are swamped in deep waters because that's God's nature, to hear and to care. And God doesn't mark iniquities. God doesn't keep the tally sheets. God doesn't weigh us in the balance as if somehow that would shape God's response. God instead forgives. God forgives freely. God forgives generously and graciously. We look for patterns. We hope that we can control life's events by always mapping out, by the best of our abilities, the way forward. But some things are random in life. Six numbers played one time on a lottery ticket do win. Six baby girls are sometimes born in a row. Salvation doesn't come because we've cracked the code of what God requires. Salvation comes because we're forgiven. An unearned, unmerited, amazing grace. And that good news is the solid ground upon which we stand by faith to emerge out of the depths. Now, in the same way, the psalm goes further And it concludes by talking about waiting 
for the Lord. As Pastor Heather has hinted at, we humans tend to define waiting always in our own terms. And we usually don't like it. Waiting in the grocery store line, waiting at the DMV to finally get a real ID, waiting for test results, as was mentioned, waiting for an income tax refund. All of us, by definition, are generally impatient. No one's surprised to hear that about you. We want things on our schedule. We want our needs to be met. But just like the answers to the earlier pop quiz perhaps flipped around some of our expectations, the Bible also speaks about waiting in a different way. The focus is not on us, the ones who wait. The focus is on God. Wait on the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Waiting is now something that is directed outward to God. It is anticipatory, like a watchman waiting for the report in the morning light that supplies are coming to replenish the storehouse. Like the watchman standing by the house, seeing the wedding party come closer so that the festivity can begin. We wait We wait with eagerness for what is to unfold, for a life on earth that is just and equitable and merciful and caring. Ways of being together that are shaped and defined by Christ, who modeled it in his own life and in whom we hope. Because of this anticipatory waiting then, we take action now. We change the laws that are unjust. We give generously to churches and charities and those in need of acts of kindness and mercy. We recognize that if 22 other people are beside us in a room, then two of us may well share the exact same birthday. But if we look deeper in that group, we'll see someone that possibly is roughly our height, maybe has a family like ours, maybe works in an area similar to our jobs, has a commonality to us, that reminds us of the shared humanness that unites us in a world that for too long looks for patterns and borders and divisions to keep us apart. See, in giving you the pop quiz earlier, my intent was that the surprising answers to those questions might help you see Advent in a different, perhaps unexpected way. We lit the first candle today, and we called it Advent Hope. Contrary to what we tell ourselves, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot get out of the depths alone or by our own resources. And so we cry out to the Lord, for whom we wait with anticipation, with expectation, with confidence, and we hope in the Lord, the one in whom we find life and forgiveness, and in the words of the psalmist, steadfast love and a great power to redeem. See, hope is something we can't give ourselves. Hope is something that is freely given, a gift from a loving, forgiving God who simply asks us to extend our arms and receive it. There's nothing random about that. And there's no formula or code to break or human-based formula to control it. It is. It simply is this gift given by God to us. Like watchers waiting for the morning, hope comes to us now and always. So this season, friends, hear and receive the good news, for we wait upon the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.